Programming is cool because we can make programs solve problems or run tasks for us. But sometimes programs feel like magic. Let's demystify how return works. Typically when we write code, we organize them into blocks that all should perform one singular action. These blocks are called functions. For example, this is a function that, hold on. This is a function, sterlin, that calculates the length of a string. When you call a function, you pass it arguments and it returns a value. To use a function, we call it by specifying the name of the declared function and the set of arguments and where to store the return value. The function call stops the execution of the code calling the function, referred to as the caller, and begins execution in the called function, or the call e. But how does a program know where to return to when the call e ends? How does the return statement return to the right location? Well, one solution could be that the location the function returns to could just be calculated at compile time and baked into the machine code of the program. Return from sterlen by jumping here, for example. The problem with this is that a function can be called from multiple places. Take this code, for example, where we have three functions, function A, B, and sterlen. Function A and function B both use the sterlen function, so hard coding an offset in the machine code wouldn't work because it needs to return to two different locations. Okay, so what if instead we created a structure that contained all the offsets, the possible return locations, and the return instruction just looked up which one to return to? This solution actually works for many cases, but breaks on computed calls, or calls whose addresses are determined at runtime. For example, in C++, a virtual class method is computed at runtime, which is called dynamic dispatch. So a return address lookup table wouldn't be able to calculate that before the program runs and track all these different return values. The solution to the return problem is actually not based on how the return statement works, but instead on how the function is called. To discuss how this works, we'll need to dive into the assembly of the function call. And don't worry, it's not complicated at all. A function call in C translates to the call instruction in Intel assembly. In other assembly variants, it has a different name, but they're all behaving generally the same way. Inside the CPU, there are variables called registers. The register we care about is PC, or the program counter. It's also referred to as IP, or the instruction pointer. The register contains the address of the next instruction to be executed by the CPU. When the processor runs the call instruction, the CPU quietly does something without saying anything about it. The call instruction not only diverts execution to the called function, but it secretly saves the program counter, now referred to as the return address, onto the stack. The stack being memory used by the program to store variables and runtime information. Sterlen begins to run and it creates a region of memory on top of the saved return address, referred to as Sterlen's stack frame. Two more variables in the CPU, the base pointer, BP, and the stack pointer, SP, determine where the stack frame for Sterlen starts and ends. Memory in the stack frame is used for Sterlen's local variables, for example, the variable i. Sterlen runs all of its code, and then it comes to the end of its execution, where the return statement is invoked. Before Sterlen returns, it collapses its stack frame so that the stack pointer, SP, or the top of the stack, points to the previously saved return address. In assembly, the return statement gets boiled down to a single instruction, ret. The ret instruction pops off the return address into the program counter, and the CPU continues execution after the call. Pretty cool, right? Well, what about the return value? Where does that go? Every processor architecture has an agreed upon convention regarding where the return value goes. In Intel assembly, for example, the return value goes into the A register, or RAX. This piece of example C code returns the value zero, which when viewed in assembly, we can see happening when the assembler loads the value zero into RAX. Because the return address controls where the program returns to and therefore the code that the program runs, it is a huge target for hackers that want to run malicious code. To learn more about that, go watch this video.